The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay. Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Nick Owen. I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of Wicked Systems. We are a dual source, self-hosted, two-factor authentication solution provider based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, in fact, we're the leading dual, host, dual source, uh, self-hosted, two-factor authentication solution provider based in Atlanta. Um, I'm going to talk to you about two-factor authentication, primarily about sort of what the options are around it. Um, as my mother-in-law says, consider the source. We're obviously a, a bit on the bias side, but I think uh, hopefully I'll challenge you to think about some um, issues around some of these uh, different options. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about implementation, sort of what we see and what we recommend as the best way to implement them and what to think about when you do impl implement them. And I'll start off by talking about what some of the bad guys are doing and how, how, why it makes so much sense to do this. Uh, hopefully I'm talking, pre preaching to the choir, but I'll cover some facts for you. Um, I apologize in advance. All my images are from uh, bad, our bad taxidermy and bad album covers. If you're familiar with those memes, um, it's going to be pretty bad. We don't have a really corporate graphics department, so we'll suffer. So first of all, I want to say thanks to the uh, self guys. This is, I think, my fourth or fifth self. Um, and always enjoy it. A lot of fun. Um, if you're around tomorrow, which I hope everyone is, uh, B-Sides Charlotte is tomorrow. It's one of the tracks. So B-Sides is a uh, information security conference meme, for lack of a better word, where usually opposite some larger conference like RSA or Black Hat that's become kind of corporate, uh, there's a non-corporate self kind of um, created conference. And um, I hooked the B-Sides Charlotte guys up with the self guys. So that's my, one of my great claims to fame. So anyway, enjoy the conference. It's a lot of fun. All right, so I'm going to talk about um, what attackers do. And some of this is probably old hat to a lot of you people, but actually there are some facts around this, fact-like facts. Are you all familiar with the Verizon DBIR report? So um, Verizon, their information security practice has been doing, it's probably like the fifth year, no, 10th year, I'm sorry, 10th year. They have been gathering um, information about attacks and analyzing them in a systematic way to sort of, um, you know, have information around what attackers do. Um, they, you could say it's a little bit biased. It's a small sample pool. You know, they get their information. They get information from the Secret Service. There's a lot of larger customers, a lot of PCI stuff. Um, but it's really kind of some of the best data that we have. And what their data tells us is that authentication is very important. Um, when you look at what attackers do by hacking methods, um, four of the top nine, exploitation of default or guessable passwords, use of stolen credentials, use of um, insufficient authentication, you know, this is what attackers are doing. They get in that way and escalate that way. If you look at the, um, this is ranked by breaches, and this is two years ago uh, information, key loggers, stolen credentials, brute force dictionary attacks, so in addition to things like, you know, SQL injection, tampering, um, but, you know, all the other ways, half of them are always involved some form of authentication. This continues to this year from uh, this year's DBIR, um, which I, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend you read it. It's, it's like, I don't know, maybe 40 pages. It's very readable, um, but very, very compelling from the information. Um, three quarters of all attacks use some form of authentication attack, either to get in or to escalate. Um, additionally, what they'll tell you is the vast majority of these are coming from the outside. So while you may be worried about employees, most of the attacks currently are coming from the outside. 40 plus percent, the vast majority are targeting servers, right? Why? Because that's where the data is. The data is the money. Um, sadly, it is taking weeks to months to discover attacks that have been going on for um, you know, that take hours to, for them to execute, take months for us to discover. I read today that the um, P.F. Chang's breach was going on for about nine months. So they've gone back to paper. Which, you know, you can just imagine there's a guy that sells carbon copy paper going, yes, because 
<laughs> awesome. All right, so that's the bad news. But um, if you look at what Verizon recommends, all right, time to get tough. Well, getting tough is really almost all basics, right? It's two-factor auth, which has been around for a long time. Segmenting the network, which if you're PCI compliant, you're already doing, but just probably not doing enough of it. Logging, AV and malware detection. Um, you know, if you're running your own software, better input validation, monitoring outbound traffic, patching, disabling Java in the browser. You know, this is, these kind of recommendations are really kind of basic. Leveraging threat feeds, I don't know. Does anyone do that? Threat feeds, anyone get threat feeds? So, you know, that's like your list, list of bad evil IP addresses and stuff like that. Um, deep depth ETDR, does anyone know what that stands for? Because I've already forgotten. I think it's some kind of uh, data loss prevention stuff. Typically, if it, are, if it has, still has two acronyms, it's not quite ready for deployment in my mind. Um, so that's a fairly sophisticated, these last two things are probably fairly sophisticated in terms of what you would do. But all this other stuff is really basics. So um, I'm going to talk about two-factor auth, talk about the options, and I'll talk a little bit about segmenting the network and some tricks you can probably do to help um, increase your security without breaking the bank. All right, so we're all familiar with two-factor auth, you know, pin, password, something you know, something you have, a hardware token, smart card, uh, something you are, um, a biometric, right? But in reality, all these things come to us through computer systems, right? So it's really a representation of these things. And, um, you know, so you really then, are, you're, still, you're still just, you're taking a risk, you're just better, taking a better risk. Um, and that becomes important because what you need to know is that they need to be replaceable. And this is the, um, this is what everyone found out when RSA was breached, is that these things sometimes need to be replaced. And that was a lot of pain for a number of people. But it was, but they did it and it was done. All right, I hope, hopefully I don't have to say this, but two of one factor is not two factor, it's just one factor. Um, you know, so, hmm? The what? Oh, yes, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> so he's saying that banks are, banks are convinced that, um, that a PIN plus a password is two-factor authentication. Um, the other one I like is the, um, the image thing, the picture. Yeah, so um, this, is, this is, I have this in another presentation, but it's, and I, I have this, you can still do this. I don't know, maybe bank, does Bank of America still do it? You can do it at Yodley Labs. And it's like they don't understand that, you know, really what's happening is a, a server is sending you an image. It's like, that's HTTP 1.0. I mean, this is really not encryption at all. Um, so uh, I'm, I'll, I'll base this on a scenario. Um, you know, I've just randomly chosen, if you're a, a retailer, this is kind of typical of what we see as customers. Um, growing, regional. You may be PC, PC compliant, or you need to be. Um, it's, it's Word itself, so I'll say you've got LDAP and they're running Linux servers. Typically what we see is you're running AD and you have Linux servers. Um, we often see a mix of, especially the larger the customer, the more mix we see in terms of BYOD and um, what you have on your desktop. Um, except for our very smallest clients, we always see sort of a sprawling network. If you're a retailer, then you're gonna have a point of sale network You'll have a network for your um, branches. You'll have a home network, you know, maybe something for the warehouses. And um, you know, this could easily be a .edu where you have, yeah, you might have a PCI compliance for processing credit cards for students and alumni. You'd have HR, you'd have finance, um, and hopefully it's not all flat. So I'm just, this is just a basis for what, what I want you to think about because um, one of the things we'll be looking at is, does this form of authentication work for me? So we'll do a little bit of strategic planning, right? And we'll think about um, what will you be protecting? Who will be using it? A lot of times we'll see, okay, the PCI order is coming on Monday. It's Friday, PCI order is coming on Monday, we need two factor off. Okay, no problem. Download the software, get the server set up. You know, we'll, we'll get it running. But they aren't really thinking about the next step. Uh, because, you know, when Target was breached, it wasn't through their PCI compliant division, it was through a third party, right? It was their HVAC, HVAC contractor. And um, 
you need to be thinking about the fact that it may not just be your employees, it may be customers, it may be third parties, it may not just be your sysadmins, it may be you know, marketing, HR, and accounting. What else should you look for? Um, in general, uh, the biggest cost in two-factor auth is typically the credential issuance and reissuance. So anything you can do to automate that process or manage it better. Um, again, you know, you look at the RSA breach and um, at various companies around the world, big boxes of RSA tokens came in and they would stuff an envelope, a FedEx envelope would be stuffed with that and sent to an executive. And it was the information security guy that was doing that because you, you, know, you can't outsource that kind of thing. Uh, logging, uh, if you look at what Deep, Verizon recommends and what you should be doing is a lot more logging and logging to a SIM so you can get more intelligence out of your logs. Uh, I'm a big believer in this and um, you know, anything y'all want to see in terms of logging. We, did, we, wrote a, we wrote a plugin for Alien Vault, so if Alien Vault's your scene, um, we've got a plugin started there. Uh, you need to have those logs and you need to be able to look at them and use them. API, I think, you know, we're, you know, I, everything I'm going to tell you pretty much is use Radius. <laughs> use a standard protocol. Um, don't, don't try and be special about this. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to want an API because you may want uh, your customer service reps able to add or delete a user or to reset a user. You may want HR to be able to do that. Um, you're going to want to automate some things. Uh, our API is available on SourceForge. It's LGPL. Um, some of our competitors, you have to you know, pay more for that or you have to talk to a salesperson. And I, I know developers love talking to salespeople, so that maybe, maybe that will be able to work for you. But I would take a look at that as well. Um, I'll cover some costs, and I'll actually, I'm just going to mostly cover hidden costs. So um, I don't have anything specific about costs, um, except for where they might crop up where you least expect them. And um, same for security risks. I'm not, you know, I think if you do two-factor off and you lock down your VPN, and, and we'll talk about segmenting and some other things, um, you're going to get a lot better handle on your security. But when you're choosing a two-factor authentication system, you need to think about the security of that system and what it relies on. Um, but the best reason for <laughs> currently you know, is to get rid of passwords. And I think it's a funny, it's been, you know, so we've been doing this for a long time. And um, for the longest time, even itself, my, I was always saying like, okay, two-factor authentication is like an ATM card. You know the pin and you have the card, so it's more secure. And then they kind of got it. A couple years ago, all of a sudden it's like, okay, tell me how you do two-factor auth. Are you like Google? Are you like, you know? And the biggest thing, the sea change of everything was the Matt Honan attack. Does everyone know about the Matt? He's the guy who, you know, writes for Wired, and someone broke into his account and deleted all his, his iFruit devices um, and got his, like, Amazon account. And I was just like, you know, this is, surely this is not going to be it. But it was such a watershed moment where all of a sudden, like, your mother knows kind of. My mother all of a sudden knew what I did. Um, but we've gone. Does your mother understand you've lost your Exactly. Um, so, <clears throat> but what, we've, what we have now, I think, is a situation where everyone's like, oh my God, I need two factor off. So we're adding it on instead of, instead of getting rid of passwords. And I think that's a mistake. All right, so let's talk about the options out there. Um, I'm not even going to cover smart cards because um, you know, the only people I know that do smart cards are the government, military, military contractors, and Microsoft. So if you're not a monopoly, it's probably not in your budget. Um, but um, biometrics are kind of interesting now in that they're, you know, it's, it's possible that you would have a biometric on your laptop or your smartphone. Um, and so the cost could be low enough where it's tempting to do it. There are some problems with it, though. I mean, I think if you're looking at it um, in terms of replacing the password to lock down your smartphone, that's probably fine. Your smartphone is probably covered with your fingerprints, so there may be problems for a determined attacker. Um, but to me, uh, the issue here is replaceability. Um, what happens when my biometric is stolen and um, you want to implement a biometric system, right? So I, you know, they're using these things now at high schools and schools and uh, gyms. What happens if my, you know, I'm going into smart bodies and all of a sudden smart bodies is breached, a 
of course, the whole network's going to be owned. They probably won't even do a, you know, will they even do a forensic analysis to know what's been stolen? So I just assume my password has been, my fingerprint's been stolen. Now they can say it's hashed, right? But just like passwords are hashed, one, no one really does it right. Two, it's just a matter of time, right? It's just in time and processing power. So you can't prove to me my fingerprint hasn't been projected. Then, you know, so ATMs, they're going to do bi biometric on ATMs. That's right, because no one ever installs a skimmer on an ATM. And um, I've, got to, I've got to say, I was like, no, I'm sorry, I can't do my biometric because it was stolen in the, you know, the great uh, hack of gold bodies, whatever. What are they going to do? You know, are they going to say use a different finger? Because some people say that, well, you have 10 fingers. I'm like, okay, that's great. So I've got, you know, bank, you know, government, whatever, you know. It's like, <laughs> you know. And then I was talking on Twitter with someone who's an IDM guy, and he's like, well, you know, and also you don't just have to use one, you can use more than one. And all of a sudden, I get a picture. It's like, all of a sudden, I'm doing like Dance Dance Revolution to try and get money out of the, you know, the bank account. Like, it's just sort of, to me, it's, sort of a, it's just a bad secret, right? Um, I, I compare it to credit cards. Credit cards are the worst secret, right? I literally give it to you so you can use it. Everyone has it that wants to use it. But logging and replaceability, right? If your credit card gets stolen, you know, and they push it all back on the vendor anyway, um, you're not adding money, and they send you a card the next day. So um, I think uh, we'll, so the other thing I would say is this is really, you know, for as long as they've been around, this is really early. Uh, Apple's only released their Touch ID API uh, a couple days ago. So we're just looking at replacing a passphrase on our token on the iPhone with Touch ID. Um, so I think it'll be a good use for that. I, we're doing it because I know someone's going to ask for it, even whether or not it's a good idea or not. Um, and so I think it'd be a good in combination with some other solution. All right, so phone-based systems. So this goes a little bit to what the banks did because in 2010, I think, the FFEIC came out with their, I think it was 09, updated um, re regulations regarding online banking, saying you had to have a stronger form of authentication. And immediately, so, you know, Every, it's like it's a, it's a huge market, right? It's going to be everyone in the world does online banking. Um, it has to work everywhere for everybody all the time. It's like, okay, so you immediately end up with like the worst possible solutions, right? It's like, it, it's, you know, and that, and that kind of requirements is not going to work. So what you get is a lot of dialback, texts, um, and, you know, and this is really kind of pre smartphone days. I mean, they were out, but everyone had Blackberries essentially. And, um, so I talked at self with one of these guys, um, a Fortune 500 CISO. They had been breached. Um, they rebuilt their entire network over the weekend and brought it back up with a phone-based uh, solution provider, right? So it was really, it was a service. Uh, so easy, easy to set up, low cost to get started. I saw him about nine months later, he was getting hammered with telephony call charges. So <laughs> there's like, you know, there's maybe three options. You can use the free version, you know, there's a text that's a little bit more, and there's dial back that's a lot more expensive. Well, the dial back is like the easiest one for all the users. So everyone was using dial back. His costs were going through the roof, and, and they were uncapped. So you talk about a hidden, you know, a hidden cost, and it's totally uncapped, and all of a sudden he's into, you know, into quite an expensive situation. Um, the other problem I have is not just the hidden cost, but the hidden security, right? So. In some cases, if you're relying on SMS or, um, you know, to a lesser degree, a dialback system, but certainly SMS, you're relying on the, oh, yeah, dialback. This was actually a dialback, I think. Um, the security of the carrier, right? And um, that can be, well, that can be easily thwarted, <laughs> right? So uh, the Cloudflare attack was 2014. It was a few months before the Matt Honan attack. And uh, Cloudflare is a CDN, right? So they do content delivery network. Um, uh, they use Google Apps for their infrastructure. And the CEO was using uh, Gmail. And for his backup, for his personal Gmail, it was a dial back solution. And the attackers took over his AT&T voicemail account and requested a password reset for his personal account. Sent to the voicemail, they used that to log in. His personal email account is the backup for his corporate account. They log into his corporate account and they delete all his customers. And interestingly, you know, they, they, sort of, they get all the data back. There's actually, it's a very good blog post about it. Google stops using voicemail for uh, backup. It's only text now and their Google Authenticator. Um, but 
there was a post um, recently about um, primarily Australian carriers. Australian carriers primarily still doing um, voicemail via um, caller ID, right? So no requirement for a PIN. And this only, I mean, this was only happened in the US like four years ago that they really started pushing PINs. Um, and it's, it's amazing to me, they like, they own the phone pretty much and yet still only do caller ID. So, the, and, the, and the reason is, if, the, if you're a, a, a carrier, a wireless carrier today, and you increase the security of your accounts, and it results in a 1% increase in your password resets a month, that's like millions of people. So there's really, they're really in, not incented to secure this any more than they have to. Um, it's the same with encryption. Why should they encrypt that stuff when they just have to decrypt it for the NSA? Um, so when you think about what you're deploying, and, this, and again, I'm biased, this could be great for you. This could be the thing that really makes sense and it fits with your risk profile. Um, but just know that you're relying on the carriers for their security and think about what that means. Okay, so we also see this, um, you know, with the, now that we're in the API economy, um, we see a lot of people, not a lot, but we see, certainly, well, we see API companies promoting, hey, you can do a one-time password system easily via our SMS system. Um, again, fine, maybe that's the kind of company you are. Maybe you like those kinds of things. Um, most of my customers want a company at the other end, a throat to choke, and it can't always be Bob in, in dev. Um, the other thing is secure coding is hard. There was one post, an SMS company said, okay, here's in PHP how you can send an OTP, uh, an OTP using our system. And I didn't even look at, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know what source of randomness they were using. I'm not a coder. But I look at it and it says post HTTP. Like, okay, first of all, you've got to at least use SSL. Um, so if you are, you know, if you're down with that, fine. But know that um, secure coding is hard and um, you should think about whose throat you're gonna choke if anything happens. Uh, all right, so now here's where I'm gonna start you know, picking on some, um, uh, picking on some things I like. Um, OpenVPN, all right, open VPN, it, the OpenVPN is a great product. Um, I really like it. Uh, they, op, the community version is awesome. The commercial version is awesomer and reasonably priced. Um, it comes with certificates, right? It uses SSL instead of IPsec. And um, so typically what you would do is you'd roll out custom certs to all your users and um, use that for identification as well as encryption. All right, what's the problem with it? It's a great way to start if you've got a small company. You know, you don't probably want to have more than 100 users on it because I think it's single threaded. But um, if you're going to grow, if you have a directory, uh, if you have HR, how do you tile that in? Who's going to manage those certificates for you when you know uh, you, when you have to let someone go? Um, so it's great, but is it the do you want really two identity management systems? Let's get more, even more personal. Is OpenVPN trying to shame the developers? So, so OpenVPN developers are trying to get Microsoft to do something via shame. <laughs> open, a, open LDAP. In the, mean, in the meantime, yeah, in the meantime, we've got to, you know, run networks. Um, so SSH, we all use it, we all love it, it's great, but it is in fact double the identity management. If you're using key management, uh, <clears throat> Um, if you're in a compliance situation, uh, how do you know, that, you know, are you using the server version that requires uh, client pa pass passphrases? Are you sure your users aren't using a client that just says it has a client pa passphrase? Um, and can you, can you regen those keys? You know, can you do all that stuff that you have to do as part of that system? The other thing, again, you've got double identity management systems. Um, you know, I know I've had to fire that sysadmin who then came knocking on the remote door, you know, minutes after he walks out the door. 
um, you know, I, I much prefer to have that be a one-stop kill button. And um, the way to do that is by tying this in through Radius and your directory infrastructure, uh, which I'll talk about later. Um, but obviously, you've got to live with it. You just need to think about, is it really, is it really the two-factor you want to live with and grow with? Um, Google Authenticator, so there are also, um, you know, this is an example of a PAM module that's been out. It works with the Google Authenticator token. Um, you know, if you're running Linux servers and you need PCI compliance, you might be able to get this through. Uh, it's not a supported product. It's on Google Code, which I, I think, I, I thought they were going to kill Google Code. Um, but, um, you know, again, it's, it, to me it's great that there are all these options out there. To me it's not necessarily an enterprise kind of solution. So if, it's, uh, if it fits your needs, great. But um, I would be concerned about logging and, again, the throat choke. Not that I want everyone choking my throat. Um, the most recent thing we've seen a lot of is authentication as a service, which tends to be sort of these push apps. Um, and so you log in with a username and password and then get a, um, a request on your smartphone saying, is this you? So they push the information to you. Um, Again, you got to look at your, you know, are you getting your logging? Um, are you getting your, you know, are you okay with that kind of control? And I understand, like, I, we have customers that are literally doing, every, they're moving everything into the cloud. Fortune 500 manufacturing, moving everything in the cloud. Um, then when they think about it, okay, well, actually, we can't have Active Directory in the cloud. And we're still going to have a home network, so it's going to have a VPN. So why do we not have our, you know, our auth server in-house? Um, and they made that decision. And now think about that same scenario. And you go with an authentication as a service provider. How do you get your auth back from the cloud? Well, one, one, according to one of my customers, one of these guys said, well, we use Radius, and it's, in, and it's encrypted. No, Radius is encoded. It's not encrypted. And if someone wants you to do Radius over the internet, they're bad people. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, you're going to need a proxy. So if you do authentication as a service, what you need is software running at home that's a proxy that's, that's running that piece. So, you know, make the call. I, you know, I, we would say just run your own server instead of running a piece of software that then runs, that talks to a server. Um, but, you know, it certainly is a very, you know, it seems to be a very popular solution and, um, and may fit your needs. All right. So needless to say, we're big fans of one-time passwords. And uh, we'll dig into these a little bit. Um, there's a few models. I don't really cover challenge response models because they don't seem to be um, very popular these days. It's a lot of extra work for the end user. Um, so primarily there's shared secrets. The shared secrets come in two flavors, time-based and counter-based. Right, so this Blizzard token is a counter-based one. Each time you push the button, you get a new code. Um, RSA and, um, you know, VeriSign. Google, all time-based. So one thing that happens with these is that, you know, you, got, you, know, you get your new token, you meet the server, look, I get a new passcode each time. And meanwhile, back on the server, there's no incrementing going on, right? So you have the sync issues. Same with clocks, right? So uh, you, you, know, you need to have uh, the time is supposed to be correct. Well, it, it doesn't if you've got a hardware token. Um, so what they do is they allow more than one passcode to be valid at any given moment. All right, so uh, you, sorry, that passcode's wrong, try again. Nope, try again, try again. And then the server looks for those three passcodes and see if they're, sequen if they're correct in some future or past time. And then it resets your clock. Uh, so, you know, as you get a six-digit number, your, whatever that is, one in a million, you get down to a much smaller space. Not that it's probably going to be a factor, frankly. Um, Typically also, you know, in the old days with RSA, what you had is you append the pen. The pen, the pen, append the pen. So you'd have seven, seven, eight, six, six, four, six, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Because that's everyone's pen. And um, then strip it at the server, and you would have both factors in that one 12 digit number, right? Possession of the token and knowledge of the pen. What we see more and more that I think is sad is username and password, and then a prompt for the OTP. And, you know, to me, that's a problem because... Really? I always thought it was just on the end. 
What, the, the, the question was around, or the statement was that no one even knew where the pin went. Did it go in the front? Did it go in the middle? Did it go in the end? I always said it went on the end, but. Um, Oh, good. Okay. Um, so um, that's interesting. And part of that, you know, part of the part of the mentality there too is that people don't. We sysadmins have been taught so long, NTLM, you know, and you do Active Directory, and so all these guys, Juniper, Cisco, everything supports Active Directory, and Radius is kind of an afterthought. And so every admin thinks that to do authorization, you need the Active Directory password, and you do not. Since 2008, when Microsoft released uh, IAS, now called NPS, which is their Radius plugin, you can do authorization based on the username without the password, and it will proxy the request away from AD to your third-party authentication server. So that's, I think that's part of the battle, is that um, you know, we're dealing with a mindset that's been a long time in the making around Active Directory. And, um, so. Uh, the problem with shared secrets. So in 2011, um, RSA was uh, attacked by an advanced persistent threat. No one knows who it is. <laughs> um, you know, resulting in the, and basically they went after their secrets, the shared secrets, which lo and behold, people didn't realize, but RSA was keeping those for RSA, licensing. RSA had promised that they weren't keeping them. <laughs> they had the question, which is we might never do another time. So that's, so it's interesting, you know, we, um, uh, we, we obviously, in our early days, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the statement was that RSA lied and said they didn't have those. I don't know about that, because um, I didn't sign the NDA, NDA to find out what happened. So you had to pay extra for them to keep it for you, so that, you could, so that you could have key, you could have chapter issue. Hmm. And they, they, they had promised they weren't keeping them, and you had to pay for that. <laughs> so RSA said they weren't keeping the seeds, and then you had to pay for them as a service to keep the seeds, but in fact, they were keeping them for everybody. That's really good business, I like that. Um, so, you know, a couple things out of this. We, we really, um, early on, I don't know how I'm doing on time, um, we never got any business from anyone that had RSA, right? Because imagine you're a security guy, and, you know, I would go, I, I would go and I'd talk to Bell South and Singular, which kind of dates me, right? Um, and the guys would get it. They'd say, oh, asymmetric encryption, that's awesome. We all have Blackberries, that's awesome. This is great. And they'd be like, okay, we're not doing it. Because, we could save the company millions of dollars. That guy saw none of it. We get, they get hacked, he's fired. It's a very asymmetric kind of thought process there, right? Um, with the Great Recession, that changes, right? So we go from being Greenfield PCI to, um, oh, in fact, we need to cut our budget by a um, million dollars, and it's either, you know, Bob and Ted go away or we squeeze the vendors. And so we saw a lot more of that. From RSA, no one was like, no one was like, okay, well, you used asymmetric encryption, so that's better. Everyone was like, we don't like the way RSA treated us. <laughs> if you weren't, you know, basically, if you were big enough, the vice president of golf and dining came and told you what happened. Got you to sign an NDA and told you what happened. If you weren't big enough, you got nothing. Um, so what we do is a request response system. Uh, it's asymmetric keys. When the user wants to log in, the pin is encrypted um, by the private key on the token sent to the server, uh, decrypted by the public key. Uh, if, they, if the encryption is valid, the account's active and the pin is correct, the OTP is encrypted by the private key of the server, returned, decrypted by the public key of the server on the token, presented to the user. So there's no, there's no clock drift, there's no whatever. Um, slightly different model, it's a little bit similar to challenge response, but a little bit easier on the end user. Um, before I get there, the, the reason, and the reason why I like OTPs is because they work everywhere, right? Any place where the, the UI is pretty much handled because every, everything uses a password, then what you really need to do is just figure out the back end. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about the back end. Um, what we recommend, and we don't always see this, but what we recommend is you don't use passwords outside of the LAN. Um, use radius and tie in your directory. We support LDAP and TACAX as well, but Radius is the only thing that will do authorization in your directory and then proxy the creds elsewhere. We're obviously, our server's looking for a um, six-digit six number, so we throw um, a log entry if it's a non-numeric passcode. We don't ding the bad passcode attempts for the user because if, some, if you've got a user named, you know, Root Smith, um, he's quickly going to get... Lost, but um, uh, 
to me, it's interesting that if, you know, there's two scenarios. One, you're just getting, you know, someone's just guessing. Two is that someone actually is guessing with a valid password, but using it in the wrong way, right? So in that scenario, you've got someone who's been phished or whose credentials have been stolen. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's just a user who doesn't know what he's doing, but perhaps, it's been, perhaps that, that's been compromised and something's going on your network that you should investigate. Um, again, if you're doing PCI, you're already doing this, but uh, servers and critical infrastructures you should treat as external. So this is where we see TACAC sometimes, is where you want command level control over your switch infrastructure. Um, but we see that very rarely. Most people still use Radius. All right, so you know, in the old days, what it looked like, oh, you had a VPN and you, all your users were in there. Um, then you know, there's the battle for the directory. Uh, Novell loses, Microsoft wins, and then we all use OpenLDAP, maybe. Um, but, uh, and then in 2008, um, again, Microsoft allows proxying. So, in the, in the, you've always been able to do this with, with free radius and open LDAP. It is so easy to do in free radius and LDAP. You just add like dial up access yes to a couple of places, and it's done. Um, NPS is a nightmare. Um, one of our most popular documents is our how to do two factor authentication through NPS. It's because, you know, otherwise it's a tech note from Microsoft that's like 60 pages long. Um, but you get a lot of benefits out of this. Your uh, directory admins, whether it's you, HR, whoever, can disable a user and lock them out of the process com completely. They do not have to have administrator rights on your two-factor auth server. Um, you can also do NAC at that point. So if you're looking at, like Verizon recommends, doing, making sure your AV is up to date, doing your malware detection, you can do it before these people get on the network. Um, in ver to varying degrees of pain. Um, you know, I, I would say, um, next, not quite here, but a lot of people are doing it. All right, so um, what time do I have to end? Okay, good. Um, so lots of benefits from this, including the fact that you now have um, potentially, you know, multi-OS, you know, uh, a lot of our customers, it's, a, it's a, a Linux box running Wicked, I'm sorry, you know, whatever, Cisco running essentially whatever, BSD, um, PFSense, whatever firewall, talking to Windows, talking to a Linux server, uh, which is pretty cool and you can do all that with Radius. And the other thing I like about Radius is it can be very simple, right? It's IP address, shared secret, and a timeout. And that's all you need to do to get it up and running. Um, and then you can get as complex as you want to with return attributes. All right, so now a couple of tricks to rule the world, right, once you have this set up. Um, the first is that any web app you have, if you can front it with Apache, you can add Radius to it. And it's pretty easy, right? It's mod auth Radius, mod auth X Radius. Um, we've got a couple of how to's. We've got a few how to's on this on How to Forge and on our website. Um, and so if you are looking at, you know, everybody's got web apps now, some customer facing, some employee facing, some vendor facing. Uh, if, you can put two fa if you can put something in front of it, um, all your CMS systems all support HTTP authentication. So put Apache in front of it and do Radius. Linux servers, PAM Radius, um, you know, beyond the sort of uh, oddness of PAM, combine the oddness of PAM with the oddness of the free Radius guy, um, but it actually works and it works pretty well. And so you can add two-factor off to anything that runs that supports PAM. So that's SSH, that's OpenVPN. I once set up a XMPP chat server that could use two-factor off. Um, uh, the interesting thing here, I think, is that you can do sudo, right, or login, anything like that. You can, you can have it use two-factor off. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I recommend is just go in and add uh, two-factor. So one, you can set up an SSH gateway. So log into the gateway with two-factor auth via Radius and then use your SSH keys out. So you kind of have as SS, SSH, SSO. Um, obviously, you want to lock down that server, that gateway server, but we see a lot of people doing that. Um, lock down sudo with two-factor auth. Maybe lock down sudo with two-factor auth for like a week and then just see what breaks. You know, it's like that old adage, like, how do you want to know what firewall rules you need? Drop them all and see, see who calls first. Um, you know, drop sudo and see what's using sudo that shouldn't be. Um, because one of the things you want to know is, hey, what's running on my network already? 
Uh, along that lines, I was talking to someone at B-Sides Asheville, who was like, well, you should do two-factor auth for egress. You know, set up your proxy and make sure they log in with two-factor auth before they get outbound. What's, what, what breaks? And what is dialing out that shouldn't be dialing out on your network? That's really valuable information. Yes? Yeah, it does. But is that, but is that, but is, but is that broken? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the question is, isn't the point of using sudo that it tracks that? Um, yes, and if, but if you're an attacker, that's what you would, you would break that logging first. Again, I'm just, you know, uh, to me it's just like, it, so, and I've got, I do have some customers that are coming in, they, and they've taken over a network, and they've taken over a Wicked server, and we're walking through them and, and having them set up their test lab and all that stuff. And some are like, you know what, i I got to own this. This is, it's going to be my, you know, it's like, it's going to be my network. Um, and so what I'm, you know, you want to have some tricks out there, you can find out what's running on it. So the next recommendation is segmentation. And if you're doing, if you are PCI compliant, you've done this, right? So you've got some credit card processing piece that is segmented out. Because what, what the Verizon found out was that most networks are really, really flat. And so it's easy to go from HR to finance to, you know, marketing to accounting. And, um, and that's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't stop the attacker. Um, what we've seen is, particularly for PCI compliance, SSH jump box. We had one customer that had a, their, were, their credit card processing systems were on Windows. And so, yeah. So what they did is they locked them down and they put up uh, FreeNX. Is anyone familiar with FreeNX? From No Machine, it was released by No Machine, but it's, um, uh, NX does um, RDP, VNC, desktop uh, sharing, uh, remote X, all tunneled through SSH using PAM for authentication. And it's incredibly fast. It is way much more easy to set up than VNC through SSH and way faster. Um, so we're big fans of that. And so basically they've got a Linux box with two-factor auth SSH tunnels to log into VNC to their Windows machines. Um, excellent, excellent segmenting. They eventually then replaced that when they, they got like a Juniper box, which would do the network segmenting they need and lock it down that way. Um, again, monitoring for the password is not a number. You know, particularly, oh, I'm sorry, question? Boy, that's a good question. I don't know. I haven't really looked at that because. Oh, so, uh, thank you. Um, how would you how would you do this? How would you do this with a container such as Docker? I haven't really looked at that much. You know, there was a little bit of a conversation on Twitter the other day about like so Docker basically compared to VMware, where VMware you you attack the hypervisor with Docker you can attack the whole kernel. Um, I didn't really get much into that. I don't know, man. You, that's tough. I think you'd have to lock down the server it's running on and each Docker instance, but I don't really know. Um, there's a Docker talk tomorrow that I want to go to. I would just avoid doing it on the production system because there's lots of security implications that most people don't consider, and so the end result is you know, you'd compromise easily if you're raising anything. So, so, the, so the, the, the response is that Docker's not ready for prime time. But there's, but, and I, I, that, that's kind of, if you look at the, um, you know, the, the wave, of um, you know security, because it's it's just it's the it's the hype cycle, right? So and um, Java is Java is coming over the curve now, I think, where all those attacks have all been patched. I mean, you don't want it to run in your browser, but and and so it comes through. Um, Microsoft the same way. Microsoft invested a lot in security and their lifecycle development piece, and um, hired some really respected names and actually gave them clout, and you know. Microsoft is a lot, you know, Windows is a lot more secure than it once was. And so Docker is really early in that life cycle. I think that's a valid point. That would be very, I'd be very careful running it in production. Um, so again, you know, looking for the uh, valid use of, uh, improper use of valid credentials and outbound monitoring. Um, let's think about that for Docker. How does this look if you segment your network and you use Radius? It looks exactly the same. Um, so to me, this is a huge benefit because, you know, 
and imagine you're coming and you're taking over network and not everything looks the same. You, that's that's it's the, the most worrisome thing you can imagine. What, really what you want is, you know, if everything's talking radius and it's all going through your directory and it's all talking to your auth server or auth servers because you can do it that way too, um, you know, that makes, makes me a lot more comfortable. Um, it also, thanks to radius, it's very easy to swap out those parts. You know, I mean, it's never hard to swap out a directory, but you can easily go from PFSense box to a Cisco to a Juniper, uh, as your scalability requires. You can easily swap out Wicked for whatever two-factor auth system you want, because they all support radius. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, the benefits. Monitor, better monitoring, um, you definitely want to segment. Um, you want to stop that lateral movement. And, you know, when you think about it, it is, uh, you know, what are they after? They're after everything. You know, there's value in HR, there's value in marketing, there's value in just shutting down your network. Um, so uh, there's, really, there's really nothing you probably shouldn't segment in some way. Um, what do you get if you do all this stuff? Uh, lockdown remote access, which gets you, you know, bad passcode, you know, you get that kind of um, um, security controls around bad password attempts, bad pin code attempts. Uh, your servers are locked down, which is where your data is. Brute force protection, better monitoring, but mainly you're in forcing the attackers to change plans. And so, you know, either you're making them go somewhere else, or you're increasing the likelihood of detection. And that's that's what it's all about. Um, all your services look the same, so it's pretty easy. Everything's talking radius. And then it's a question of like, oh, you, so you want to roll out a new content management system? Does it support radius? Does it support HTTP off? If so, yes, then it's in the box. Um, we get a lot of questions like, oh, do you work with Checkpoint? Do you work with Cisco? Really, the question should be, do you support our authentication standard? Um, and yes, we do. Uh, hopefully, less password use. You know, w when we started a long time ago, we're like, people are going to get sick of passwords. They're, too ex they're more expensive than you think. Now it's at the stage where you have to have yeah, I mean, everyone's seen the jokes about needing a hieroglyph and a capital letter and, you know, your mother's maiden name all in the password. It's really kind of becoming like that. Um, and it's kind of sad. So uh, I, we recommend you really look at getting rid of passwords as much as possible. In that vein, if you are looking at rolling out two-factor off, you should probably look at doing some form of single sign-on as well um, and try and reduce the number of authentication points. Um, there is some interesting stuff going on in that realm. Um, we currently support SAML for Google, um, but we're also looking at OpenID Connect as well as uh, JSON Web Tokens, or JOTS as they're called. Uh, OpenID Connect is sort of the bastard stepchild of OAuth and OpenID but may actually have some, um, it's kind of the best of both of them, um, and seems to have some interesting legs. Uh, JOTs are kind of interesting because it's basically, it's a JSON, you know, encoded message saying trust this, don't trust this. Um, and it seems to be one of those things that have swelled up from developers rather than pushed down by vendors. Uh, so then we may actually be on the verge of uh, usable SSO. Um, that's it for me. I've got probably about 10 minutes for questions. Everyone should enjoy the conference, I hope so. And if you need to get me, here's my information. What's your opinion on FIDO? FIDO. So FIDO is the, um, my opinion on FIDO, um, is the, uh, what does it stand for? Fast Internet something. It's, it's, it looks like it's a, it's a implementation so, of this, of this mm -hmm. question. So I have another, my other, I did a talk recently on uh, the history of two-factor authentication. And in it I talk about the Liberty Alliance, which started in 2001, right? It was backed by Google, Microsoft, PayPal, and others. Um, the, um, God, what's the other one? Um, Liberty Alliance, Oasis, uh, which started SAML, which is backed by Microsoft, Google, PayPal, and others. Um, and uh, OpenID, backed by uh, Google, Microsoft, PayPal, and others. Um, and now there's FIDO. It's backed by Google, Microsoft, PayPal, and others. You go to LibreAlliance.org, and it's like 404 images on all their logos. Um, the, um, so Radius is a great standard. Free Radius is awesome. The community is awesome. 
when Heartbleed hit, you saw them work on the patches and work through it. It's a robust 3.0 server um, based on an open standard. Fido, to me, is a vendor, Knock Knock Labs, that has said, okay, we want to be big in this space, so let's start a standard. Um, maybe that'll be great, maybe we'll implement it, but um, I'm not rushing to that. I sort of think that if the users demand it, then um, that'll be good. To me, the issue isn't so much like, you know, we could support Google in our token, and you could have one token that did your Google and Wicked. Um, you know, in a way, that's just sort of, you still have, the keychain is small because it's on your device. Um, you know, to me, the important standard is around SSO and radius. And if you can get a good SSO standard um, that actually works for customers, then um, that's more important than a standard way to implement the two-factor offline. I'm a little, yeah, I'm a little jaded by the whole Liberty Alliance, Open ID Foundation, you know. Um, any other questions? Did anybody see the um, breach this week by, what was it called, the code hosting company? Code bits, code partners. Code base, what? Code spaces, yeah. So code spaces, got, uh, they got a DDoS first and then um, went to go and you know, back up their customer data on Amazon, or started changing their Amazon credentials. And the people already had control of the credentials, saw them trying to get it back, and wiped out all of their stuff. Um, so one of the things I think that's, uh, you know, this is a bit a long time coming, but all this growth in cloud-based services, uh, where, and the same with Google Apps, if you're doing Google Apps, you know, you really need to do SAML. Um, two reasons, one is that you can use their Google Authenticator, but if something goes wrong, who do you call on customer support? It's just kind of the weak point. Um, same with Amazon, they may have better customer support, but I have my doubts. You have to pay for it ahead of time. Okay. <laughs> you have to pay for, you have to pay for the, um, escalation before it happens on Amazon. Okay, so on Amazon, you just pay for escalation before it happens. Um, whereas with SAML, you know, I, and I have screwed up my SAML interface and been locked out of my Google Apps test accounts um, because I've uploaded the wrong keys. Yeah, there we go. And, uh, but, you know, at that point, you still own the, um, you know, you own the users and you can control them and re-enable users and stuff like that. Um, there is a site, after, after, after all this Matt Honan kind of uh, hoopla and everyone wanted two-factor auth, there's a site now called twofactorauth.org. Two which is kind of a name and shame site, and basically it's tell every web service, do the, what forms of two-factor auth do they support, and um, you know, and if they don't have it, ask them. If they're getting it, thank them. Um, and I, you know, Wicked is up there as a provider, and I was talking, I was like, well, what about, you know, SAML, what about other, because you know, really what you want is these services, if you're an enterprise, you want, the, you want to know what kind of um, SSO standards these guys support. And um, you know, they decided it wasn't really in their purview. But to me, this is one of the things, I'm, I'm thinking about as sort of the next research project is what, what SSO standards do they support? How do you do, you know, um, what's the customer support in terms of an event and escalation? If you get locked out, what happens? Because I was locked out of a Google Apps test account for like six months. <laughs> I was just like, okay, well, let's just wait until they email me back and I'll move on to, I'll create another account, basically. Um, anything else? All right, enjoy the conference. I've got a, I'll be here, I've got a table right around the corner, so if you have any questions you're too shy to ask in front of this robust crowd, come and see me. Thank you. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. 
Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.